Have you noticed how our world just seems hostile, divided, angry? The gospel intends to solve that, and this is a sermon I preached earlier this summer where we look at how the gospel can do just that. When I was in junior high school, I had to have a music elective. <laughs> yeah, well, for some people, it's woo. For me, it's like, oh, man, right? Uh, and so I had to have a music elective, so I signed up for choir. My wife has a music degree. I don't, and there's a reason for that. But I signed up for choir in junior high, and, uh, you know, we had done our little practices for a few weeks, and we were ready for our very first concert, and we were going to go sing at some elementary school in Tacoma, Washington, where I grew up. So we, 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 they bus us to the, the school, and we're going to sing for this, you know, this, in the gym for these kids, and they got the risers all set up, and we get our, our you know, royal blue ro choir robes on, those little 12 and 13-year-olds. We get those gold little whatever those things are they put with the choir robes, you know, those pointy things you throw over your head and around your neck, right? And we get those on. We get up on our risers, and we're getting ready to warm up. And... and <clears throat> We're, you know, we're standing there. All of us are up on there, and most of us look exactly the same. Royal blue robes, gold little things around our neck, nice white smiling faces, but there's Byron. Byron looks a little different. Byron, before we start warming up, looks side to side and blurts out as loud as he can, I feel like a chocolate chip in a sea of vanilla. And I can understand why Byron would say that, because he was a little darker than me, you know? And here's the thing. It's really easy for us to notice our differences, isn't it? It's really easy for us to notice whether it's the way we look, where we came from, how we talk. It's easy for us to notice our differences. And sometimes those differences, like, they're deep, they're deep culturally, they're deep socially, they're deep whatever it is, and they get all twisted up inside our heart and our head, and they kind of mess up how we feel about, how we talk about, how we think about each other, don't they? So, let's follow up Byron's story with another story. A handful of years ago, my wife and I went on a little vacation to... Uh, the East Coast. We wanted to go visit, you know, a bunch of the little, you know, well-known touristy historical sites on the East Coast. And so we were going to go to Boston. We were going to go to Philadelphia. But we started in Washington, D.C. So we get a hotel. This was in the days before the Internet. So you actually had to, you know, like call to make a reservation for a hotel. You didn't really know what the hotel looked like or any of that. You didn't have the Internet to help you out. So we call. We make a reservation. We drive uh, to, to Baltimore. We get to our hotel, we check in, we figure we need a few supplies, so we're going to go to the grocery store. So we drive to the grocery store. I don't even know what kind of grocery store it was. We walk into the grocery store, and it's my wife and I and two other friends from Bible college. We're all Christian people. We all love Jesus. We walk into this grocery store, and we start you know, looking for what we're, uh, the, whatever supplies we're going to buy, and our friends... You would have thought they were going to have a panic attack. They start sucking air. <laughs> like they're panicking. And then all of a sudden he blurts out, We got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. And I'm like, Why? And he says, We're the only white people in the store. We can notice our differences. And they can mess up our thinking. They can mess up. Our, we're in a grocery store in the middle of the day. What are you worried about? But because we notice our differences, and because those differences get all twisted up inside of us, our thinking gets messed up. And we don't respond to each other the way we ought to. Right? It's not only race. It's not only the color of our skin, the race, you know, that we come from that gets messed up. It can be your social status. Right? Like, Show up to a party, you drive up, and you're in your 25-year-old run-down Toyota Camry. That's what I drive. And, and you pull in, and it's BMWs and Mercedes, you know, and all these nice fancy cars, and they're freshly washed and waxed, and they look good, and immediately you realize, oh man, 
It's a different crowd that I'm used to hanging out with. You go into the party, and the food's really nice, and the people are really dressed up, and you can tell, these guys have money, they have clout, they have status, not me. How do you feel? How do you respond? What goes through your heart, your head? How do you think about those people? What do you assume about those people? See, we notice our differences, and it forms assumptions about them and about us and about how they look at us and how we look at them, and it can mess us all up. Can it? Can it? it doesn't matter whether it's race, whether it's status, whether it's wealth, whether it's, whether it's hearing or not hearing, whether it's um, handicapped or not handicapped. We notice our differences, and it affects our assumptions and our reactions to people. And the gospel speaks to that. And Galatians speaks to that. So what I want to do tonight is I want to walk through a, an episode that Paul recounts in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2, beginning in verse 11. I want to, Paul kind of has this little story that he just calls to mind. I'm assuming it's because for the Galatians, it was a familiar story that maybe even those opponents that we talked about last night uh, were using to maybe, you know, put Paul down and to raise themselves up. And Paul wants to address this story. So he calls the story to mind. I want us to walk through the story. We're going to look at a lot of text of the story. There's some, a lot of theology in here. There's a lot of kind of narrative in here. So we're going to have to work through some stuff. But this text and what it says about the gospel and what it says about our differences is desperately needed in your life, my life, our country, and our world. All right? So you need to make sure you listen closely as we work through this tonight. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, begins this way. But when Cephas came to Antioch, now Cephas, just to clarify, is Peter. It's another name for Peter. So this is Peter. Cephas is his Aramaic name. Uh, so when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face. Here is the Apostle Paul getting toe-to-toe, eyeball-to-eyeball -to -eyeball with the Apostle Peter about an issue because of something that Peter did. Right? Sometimes even apostles don't see things eye-to-eye. -eye. Sometimes even apostles need to be called out because they don't always live up to the gospel. Peter had a problem, and Paul wasn't going to let him get away with it. So Paul opposed him to his face. In fact, as Paul recounts the story, Paul says, because he stood, what word is it? He stood condemned. And that's strong language. This is an apostle. This is not just any apostle. This is Peter. This is like the rock, right? This is the one who preached the first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost. And Paul says, yeah, but he was wrong. Dead wrong. So I got in his face and I let him know about it because he stood condemned. Oh, what in the world did Peter do? Like, man, this, this sounds serious. Like, did Peter have an affair? Did he cheat on his wife? Peter steal money out of the church offering? What did Peter do that, that made it so Paul got in his face? Well, keep reading. Paul, or Paul as he recounts, says, for prior to the coming of certain men from James. We'll talk about that in a second. He, Peter, used to eat with the Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? Non-Jews. People who are different than Peter and his culture and his people and his heritage and his upbringing. It's the major racial and cultural and social div uh, division in Peter's day. So Peter used to eat with the Gentiles... Um, but when they came, these men from James, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof. So let's just clarify a little bit about what's going on. I think I got a map. Do we have a map? Um, yes, there we go. Jerusalem, down south. Antioch, where this episode happens up north. It's about 300 miles between them. Antioch is right at the very northeastern quarter, uh, corner of the Mediterranean. So James is one of the major church leaders in Jerusalem. Big, powerful voice in the church at Jerusalem. He's the brother of Jesus. And he's got a lot of influence on Jerusalem. And 
Paul is up here at this church in Antioch that's predominantly Gentile, has some Jews in the church, but is mostly non-Jewish. It's in some ways sort of like this first real cross-cultural church that's sort of trying to be this hybrid between Jews and non-Jews. And, and Peter's, or Paul's been teaching up there. Well, apparently Peter decided to come for a visit. This is Peter. Peter who had the vision of the, the great white sheet, right, with Cornelius, and don't call, God tells him, don't call anything unclean that I've called clean. Peter, you know, who stood up on the Jerusalem conference for, um, you know, Gentile inclusion and all this. Peter, he decides to come for a visit to Antioch and just check out what Paul's doing up there. And when he first comes up there, all is great, right? Like, you know, a, a, a Gentile family invites him over for dinner, and Peter's all over it. Yeah, I'll come and eat dinner. It doesn't matter. I'll come and eat with you, right? Small group invites him over for, you know, potluck with their small group. And Peter says, no problem. I'll come. He comes and eat. And then a few weeks later, a couple months later, I don't know how long, but here's what happens. Some, some men from James, in other words, some men from the Jerusalem church. Now, did James really send them? Did they just use James's name to try to have some clout or authority? Because we know people do this, right? Uh, don't know. We don't, Peter, Paul doesn't tell us. So we don't know exactly. My suspicion is, based on other things in the New Testament, that, that these guys weren't really sent by James. They just used James's authority to try to back their case. That's my guess. But that's reading between the lines, and it's purely a guess. But these men from the Jerusalem church, using James's authority in some way or another, show up in Antioch, and all of a sudden, Peter's like, yeah, yeah. No, I can't come to dinner tonight. No, no, thanks for the invite, but not kosher. Can't be there. And Peter quits eating with the Gentiles. He quits eating with these Gentile Christians because these ultra-conservative Jews show up at Antioch. Somehow they had enough pressure. Somehow they had enough appeal. Somehow they were persuasive enough that, that Peter felt the pressure, and all of a sudden, he's not going to eat with those, with those Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ. How do you suppose that made those Gentile brothers and sisters feel? Not only that, this is Peter. Peter's like, he's like the bigwig from Mama Church. So it's not just Peter. It's like, well, does Jerusalem really feel that way about us? Do all the Jews and Jewish Christians really feel about us? Are we that awful that you can't even treat us de decently? It gets worse. It gets worse. This is Peter. Peter's influential, so keep reading, and look what happens. He began to hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision, and the rest of the Jews joined him in the hypocrisy, meaning the other Jews in the church at Antioch said, well, if Peter won't eat with those Gentiles, then we're not going to eat with them. And they don't eat with them. It gets worse than that. And not only that, but Barnabas, Barnabas, Paul's companion in ministry, was somehow persuaded by this. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I think Peter's got a point. Yeah, I think that's probably best. What just happened? You have Gentile church and you have Jewish church. And we're not going to get together because, because they're Gentiles. They're Gentiles. So we just can't eat with them. We just can't treat them well. We just can't do that. We can't socialize with them. We can't hang out with them. And now the church is split right down the very lines that culture was split down in Paul's day. The major division in culture was Jew and Gentile split. And everyone knew it. Now, now the church is split along, along those exact same lines. <clears throat> now here's the thing. This is not a minor issue. I mean, I think our reaction is like, Peter, Barnabas, Jews, guys, get over it. Eat with them. What's the big deal? Right? That's sort of our reaction. It's like, just go, 
go to potluck. And maybe Gentiles, be considerate and don't serve ham. Right? Like, let's just all work together here. And that's sort of our reaction. This is so easy. Let's just work it out. Right? Just treat each other with a little bit of love and kindness. You should be able to do this. Right? But our differences run deep. Our differences run deep. And they get all twisted up in our heart and our head, and they mess up our thinking, and we don't always see straight. So let's not just, you know, let's not just make it seem like this would have been easy for Peter. In fact, let me actually put a little culture behind this so that you can understand how serious this is. Okay, like, it would be, it would be next to impossible for us to overemphasize how important eating together was in the culture of Jesus, Peter and Paul's day. Like, we can't overemphasize how, like, like ate with like. That's why the, the Pharisees got so upset with who? Jesus, for eating with who? Those tax collectors and sinners. Because like ate with like. Um, and for Jesus to eat with them was to raise them to a level or to lower himself to a level where they were, they were equal because that's the way it worked. Not only that, when you deal with food laws among the Jews, like, I mean, like, we're like, yeah, food laws, Old Testament, food laws, smooth laws, don't worry about that. Let's just toss those things away like they're no big deal, right? But not for the Jews. So, for example, in, in the period between Malachi and Matthew, the intertestamental time period, there was all sorts of upheaval in uh, Israel among the Jews because of all the political stuff going on and the nations kind of vying for that land. And one of the ways that played out was you, you, you're not going to be able to you know, keep your food laws. You're not going to be able to circumcise your babies and all these things that were important works of the law for the Jews. How do you think the Jews responded to that? You can tell us that we have to, you know, that we can't eat our distinctive foods and we have to eat your foods, but guess what? You can kill us if you want, but we're not going to eat it. Oh, you, you can tell us we can't circumcise our babies, but guess what? We're circumcising our babies. And they did. And, Anti and Antiochus Epiphanes killed their baby, hung them around their neck, and paraded them through downtown Jerusalem to say, This is what happens if you circumcise your baby. But that didn't stop them. Because the food laws and circumcision and Sabbath, that's what marked them out as unique and distinctive. Our differences are deep. Our cultural upbringing is deep. And now here's Peter, and he's, he, the, the gospel's at work in his heart and his soul, but all of a sudden these Jews come from Jerusalem and they begin to put pressure on him, right? And, and all of a sudden he's like, well, I am the apostle to the Jews after all, and I don't want to compromise my ministry to the Jews. And If I eat with those Gentiles, it might hinder my ability to actually speak to the Jews because I know how they feel about these things, so I'm just not going to eat with them. This is hard, right? Like, overcoming some of these things is difficult. It doesn't just go away in one night, and Peter's struggling. And Paul's like, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not buying it, and I'm not tolerating it. And so he opposes Peter to his face. Um, well, keep reading in the text. Well, before we do that, actually, before we read in the text, I want you to think of something. I want you to imagine something. I want you to picture a table, a dining room table. Picture a dining room table. You see it? Um, who's sitting around this table with you? Who's sitting around this table with you? When you normally eat at a table like this, who do you invite over? What's that? Family and friends sitting around that table with you. Right? People whose company you enjoy. People you know, people you like, right? Maybe, maybe since we've got some young people in the room, students in the room, maybe it's not a dining room table, maybe it's this kind of table. Go to the next picture. <laughs> Who are you sitting with? <laughs> Classmates, right? Your friends at school. It's who you're hanging out with, right? These are my people, right? Um, yeah, the reality is, is we're not much different. Maybe it's not quite as deep as eating together as it was in the first century, but we, we tend to eat with people who are like us. We tend to eat with people whose company we enjoy, like with like, people who are like us, people who make us comfortable, don't we? It's who we eat with. Here's the thing. Eating together is actually a gospel activity. 
And Peter's, Peter's actions aren't just a food activity. It's not just, come on, Peter, just be a little nicer to people who aren't like you. The problem is a gospel problem, and that's why Paul's so upset. The reason Paul gets in Peter's face is because Peter has a gospel problem. Let's keep reading. Look, look what's actually said here. Verse 13. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, not 13, 14. Uh, but when I saw, look at verse 14. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the gospel. It's a gospel issue. The fact that Peter and the Jews are pulling away from the Gentiles, that's not just a simple issue. That's not just like a preference issue. That's not just like, oh, you know, eh, kind of here and there. It's a gospel issue. And that's why Paul is so upset. And that's why Paul gets in Peter's face. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, I said to Peter, in the presence of everybody, Notice that. He doesn't even pull him aside. Because this is Peter. And he's a leader. And he has influence. And what he does and says influences other people. So now other people are withdrawing. So guess what? Peter, you've made a public problem, so you're getting a public confrontation. So I said to Peter, in the presence of everybody, uh, and then Paul begins to summarize his speech to Peter. He says, if you, being a Jew... Live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. How is it now that you're compelling the Gentiles to live like the Jews? In other words, what he's saying is, Peter, if just, just a week or two ago you could disband with food laws and the, the Jewish taboos about who to eat with and who not to eat with and what to eat, if you could do that and eat with these Gentiles just a little bit ago for the sake of the gospel... And now all of a sudden, you're like, well, no, no, really, you Gentiles, if you really want to be followers of Jesus and really be able to experience fellowship with us, you've got to become like us. So you're not good enough the way you are. So if you really want our company, uh, our company who are like the, the foundation of, the heritage of your faith, if you want to enjoy our fellowship, then you need to become like us. And Paul's like, Peter, how in the world can you do that? How in the world can you do that? How can you compel them to become Jews when just a week ago you were willing to disband with your Jewishness and eat with them? And what Paul, what Paul is saying is the gospel intends to break down the barriers that keep us apart from people who are different from us. The gospel intends to bring people who are culturally different, racially different, socially different, economically different, status different. It intends to bring us all together at one table as one family and friends sitting around a table enjoying a meal together. Equals, like with like, as friends and family in Christ. Um, and Peter has messed that up. Now, <clears throat> as I was reflecting on preparing this message. Immediately, I thought of an episode that happened in the classroom a number of years ago when I was teaching Galatians at Boise Bible College. I actually thought of a student at the time and the way he reacted to this teaching. And this student is now sitting in this audience. I didn't know you'd be here this, this week. So Dave Fortescue is sitting right here. <clears throat> and Dave, where are you from, Dave? Zimbabwe. Dave is from Zimbabwe. Uh, and so Dave was in the classroom, and I'm teaching Galatians, and I'm teaching this concept about, like, you, you know, the gospel's bringing us together, and, and it, it tears down our racial divide and all that. Well, he's from Zimbabwe, and Dave just blurts out in the middle of class. He says, if I teach this the way you're teaching it in Zimbabwe, I don't think it's going to go over very well. I don't know what, if anything's changed in the last 15 or so years in Zimbabwe, but back then, Dave was like, because, like, the white people go to church with the white people, and the black people go to church with the black people. And the white people and the black people, they don't, they don't mix too much. They try to they, they keep their, their, their separate spaces. Now, I don't know if that's changed much in Zimbabwe or not. But what this teaching is, what David was hearing in this teaching is, the implications of the gospel is, it should not be that way, my friends. And if we're going to preach the gospel, I mean, if we're going to preach the whole gospel, and nothing but the gospel, so help us God, if we're going to do that, then it's going to tear down the walls between us, and it's going to build bridges between us, even if we're different. Even if we're different, and even if those differences run deep. 
went out. Listen to what, what Peter says. We're going to walk through the next paragraph where he summarizes his, his speech to Peter, and he kind of broadens it out and generalizes it for everyone else to hear, us included, and it is one of the most central texts in the entire book of Galatians, okay? So you need to hear this passage. It's deep. There's a lot in it. We can only do it pretty quick, okay? Because I don't think we want to be here till midnight. Last time someone preached at midnight that I read about it didn't work out so well for somebody anyhow. So there's a few people who know the book of Acts there. All right, good. Uh, look what it says. Paul's summarizing his speech to Peter and all everyone listening in. We are Jews by nature and not Gentile sinners. I think you could put that in quotes. That's, that's the way Jews looked at Gentiles. All right? Paul's probably being a little sarcastic even. Like, we're Jews. We're not those Gentile sinners. All right? Keep going. Let's keep reading. And he says, And because we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, nobody's going to be justified. Now, there's a lot in that sentence. There's a lot in that sentence. Let me just point out a couple things. Notice, first of all, the repetition of the phrase, works of the law. Now, he highlights, he says it three times. Flip to the next slide here, if you will. Just want, there you go. Um, that man is not justified by works of the law, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Like, works of the law, what is that referring to? What is works of the law? Law of Moses. It's very important at this point that we don't generalize it. So often when we read phrases like this in Romans, Galatians, and elsewhere, we generalize it to just any works. Any works, like any activity for Jesus, any activity for God. That's not quite the point here, all right? So before we generalize and figure out how it applies to us, let's actually hear what Paul is saying. This is works of the Old Testament law. This is food laws. This is circumcision. This is Sabbath keeping. It's that sort of stuff. The stuff um, that, you know, the Jews were known for and that marked them out and, and signaled they are different, they're different, all right? So works of the law. And so um, that's really important. It's going to be important for the rest of our week as well to make sure we understand that Paul's not generalizing. He's being very specific about a particular kind of works and a particular kind of law, Old Testament law, the law of Moses, right? Nobody, he's saying, is going to be justified by the law of Moses. And he's saying, we Jews know that because we know that. And every Jew in the first century just about would agree with Paul on that. Why? Well, because read their history. Read the Old Testament. What happened? As they failed to keep the Old Testament law, they ended up where? In Babylon, under a curse. And most Jews in the first century knew the curse hadn't totally been lifted because God's Shekinah glory hadn't returned to the temple. So they knew they were still under the curse. And they knew the law wasn't going to be the one that justified them. So how are they going to get justified? Well, Paul's just operating off that assumption and saying, because we know this as Jews, we've looked to be, be justified in Jesus the Messiah. And so that's the next word I want to highlight. If we go to the next slide, notice the word justified uh, through this section. He repeats it as well. Flip ahead, one more. <clears throat> and we got justified by the works of the law. We got justified by faith in Christ. We got justified no, by the works of the law. No flesh will be justified. Like, like, Listen, this is the central paragraph about justification in the book of Galatians. It's the central paragraph about justification in Galatians. Now, what is justification about? What does justification mean when it says that no flesh will be justified by the law, that we've looked to Jesus to be justified by faith? What does justified mean? What does the word justified mean? It's a big, big Bible theological word. We need to know what it means in this context. So, all right, class, what does justified mean? All right, one of the implications of it, I heard it over here, is uh, just as if I'd never sinned. And it's a very common way to say, here's kind of an easy way to remember what it's about. But that's more of the effect of justification. God treats me just as if I'd never sinned. All right? So what does the word itself refer to? Anyone know? Comes out of the imagery of the law court. So picture a courtroom. And you have a judge, you know, in the courtroom sitting at the judge's bench. You've got somebody who's been accused of a, a crime. In this case, they actually committed the crime. Um, but 
but they've been given some sort of pardon. I don't know, maybe it was a presidential pardon. I don't know what kind of pardon it is. It was a pardon. And so the judge pounds down his gavel and says, you're pardoned, you're free to go. Not guilty. And your record is completely cleared and expunged. Justification means to be declared not guilty. Declared not guilty. That's what it means. And so what this little sentence is saying is saying, look, we Jews know that we're not going to be declared not guilty. We're not going to get a favorable verdict before God because of the works of the law. How are we going to get a favorable verdict by God? Well, we're only going to get a favorable verdict by God if, if we put our faith in Jesus. And through Jesus, we're declared not guilty guilty okay Paul says we Jews know that that's why we put our faith in Jesus we all know that that's why we've put our faith in Jesus we know the only way to be in right standing with God is through faith in Jesus not through the law of Moses right it's only by faith in Jesus all right let's keep reading and let's hear a little bit more what he says so he says we know this we know that it, you know we're, we're justified by faith in Jesus not by the works of the law but, verse 17, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, what he means by that is, if, in other, in, if we're going to be justified by faith in Jesus, then we have to admit we're sinners. And we've, it's, it's true. We, we Jews have acknowledged that we're guilty too. And we need God to pardon us. And guess what? All of us, we're guilty too, right? And we needed God to pardon us. We couldn't just, you know somehow get the pardon on our own. That's the point of being found sinners. We're found sinners. Well then, is Christ a minister of sin? In other words, if Jesus pardoned sinners, is Jesus in league with sin? No. No. And Paul finds the question so, so like unnecessary and so un, you know un, being undignified of giving an answer to it. he just says may it never be and then he points the finger at Peter and all the other Jews and says this if I rebuild what I once tore down I prove myself a transgressor in other words Peter you tore down the law and you ate with the Gentiles then these other people showed up and you rebuilt the law and you wouldn't eat with the Gentiles who's the transgressor in the house Peter you're the transgressor in the house and all you Jews who joined Peter, Barnabas, and all you others, you're the transgressor in the house because you're rebuilding the law after Christ tore it down and you joined him in that to eat with these guys. And so now you've become guilty of actually going against what Christ wants done because who was the one that showed how important eating with people is to the gospel? Jesus. Because Jesus would eat with anybody because that's how important eating is. When it comes to the gospel and so he says you're actually the transgressor and paul then says in verse 19 man we don't have time to deal with verse 19 but we're, let me just read it to you for through the law i died to the law so that i might live to god behind that one sentence is paul's entire understanding of the old testament law we don't have an hour or so to talk about that <clears throat> okay but here's what it is. In, in a nutshell, this is what Paul believed about the law, that the law couldn't justify. Its day was over, and therefore it was time to move to a new way of being justified. And so as a Jew, Paul says, the law brought me to a point where I realized the law wasn't going to work, so I died to the law so that I could live for God. Man, there's so much that Paul has to say about that. We'll get into a little bit more of that tomorrow night, okay? But for through the law, I died to the law um, in order that I might live for, to God. And then, he, then he, the well-known verse out of this paragraph, probably one of the most well-known verses out of Galatians, shows up here. Um, for it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And, and the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith. Not the Torah, not the law. Paul was once one of those ultra-conservative Jews, but the life I now live isn't governed by the Torah. The life I now live is governed by faith in Jesus. And Jesus eats with Gentiles. Jesus eats with sinners. So I do too, and you should as well. You should as well. For the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I don't nullify the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, if the, the way God wants us to live is governed by the Old Testament law, then Christ died needlessly. Christ died needlessly. Now, 
Paul's point in all of this is if you're connected to Jesus and you're connected to Jesus, then guess what? You're connected to each other. It doesn't matter whether you like the way each other looks, smells, talks, or anything else. If you're connected to Jesus and you're connected to Jesus, then you're necessarily connected to each other. And you better figure out how to get along with each other and you better work hard at it because the gospel intends to build bridges, not walls. Um, and so God in Christ is building bridges between people of all different stripes, colors, backgrounds, cultures, abilities, disabilities, and everything else under the sun. God is bringing people together into one new humanity. This is a gospel issue, and this is central to the gospel. It's not just a racial issue, right? It's not just a difference issue. It's a gospel issue, and God in Christ is bringing people together. So if he or she or you are connected to Jesus, then you're all connected to each other, and let's work hard to figure out how to get along with each other, and let's eat together. Let's eat together in Christ. A handful of years ago, um, my wife and I were sitting in a small group with a, a group of friends, and we were attending a church that was working really, really hard at forming a true kind of mission partnership with, a, with uh, some churches in the Ukraine. And, and so uh, this church would send people over to the Ukraine to work with them, to see what they were doing, to learn from them, because they were having some very effective ministry. And then people from the Ukraine would come back to the States to come to our church and share with us and and learn from us, and we would have a conversation with them so that we could have this real partnership between, instead of just sending missionaries, we were trying to form a partnership uh, between these churches in the States and the Ukraine. It was, it was a really a beautiful approach to missions where we actually felt like we got to know each other. So my wife and I are sitting in this small group uh, with a group of friends of ours, um, and one of the pastors from uh, the church in Ukraine, his name was Zhenya, and his translator, whose name was Nick. Nick is not a believer. But he's the translator that's come with Zhenya. So there we are. We're eating together. We're having a meal. And we're having conversations. And we're asking questions of Zhenya. And he's answering through the translator to us. And in the course of the conversation, we realized, man, life at this point in Ukraine was really pretty difficult and pretty hard. Uh, inflation was through the roof. Poverty was all widespread. Uh, food lines were everywhere. And it was difficult times, right? And Zhenya had seven kids. It's hard enough to feed yourself, yet alone a, you know, a family with husband, wife, and seven kids. So one of us asked in the group, how in the world do you make ends meet, right? How in the world do you provide for your family? And all of a sudden, there's a very brief answer from Zhenya to Nick, the translator. And then there's a, a conversation between Nick and Zhenya, back and forth, back and forth. And then all of a sudden, Nick just looks at us and says, Zhenya says, we're taken care of. I tried to get more information, but he said you would understand. And we nodded our head, and we smiled, because we know the same God who takes care of us and meets our needs. And Nick was baffled and mind-blown that we, who couldn't speak Zhenya's language, could understand what Zhenya meant. And he, who could speak Zhenya's language, had no clue what Zhenya was talking about. Why? Because Jesus transcends our cultural differences and Jesus transcends our linguistic differences Jesus brings people together even if they don't speak the same language we have more in common because of Jesus than we do that drives us apart and the gospel intends to bring us together and that's why this is a gospel issue and that's why Paul gets in Peter's face Peter you're tearing down the gospel you're going against the gospel. Now, my friends, look at our world. Is our world divided? Are there hostilities between different groups of people? Hostility between different races? Hostility between people of different political ideologies? Is our world divided? The gospel wants to end that division and bring people together. And if we actually, genuinely, truly understand justification by faith, we'll understand that justification by faith don't, doesn't only fix this relationship, fix this relationship, too. In fact, I think the way we could summarize one of the main points of this text is this. 
Justification by faith undermines socializing by race. If we believe in justification by faith, then we've got to be willing to um, figure out how to get along with, talk with, eat with, spend time with people of different races who are different than us, who understand life different than us, who look at the world different than us, who have different assumptions about the world than us, who have different experiences than us, whose experiences we can't understand, Um, people who perhaps, because of their their racial upbringing, kind of look on us with a little bit of suspicion, a little skepticism. They're not sure they can trust us, and we're not so sure how we feel about them, and we're going to have to say, but we're justified by faith, so we're going to have to move a little closer. We're going to have to move a little closer. We're going to have to sit down over coffee and over breakfast. We're going to have to try to get to know each other. We're going to have to try to really hear each other and listen to each other. We're going to have to try to believe the best about each other and give each other some space to be different and grace when we make mistakes. Because the gospel, justification by faith, undermines socializing by race. Not only that, I mean, we could add other things in that race, right? Like it's whatever makes us different and drives us apart, we could add other things in there. We could add status. Like, justification by faith undermines socializing by status. Like, you who are poor learn to have dinner with the wealthy who you feel like maybe have taken advantage of you, and you who are wealthy actually learn that the poor are are, all looking for a handout. Like, let's figure out how to get get along at different status, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what it is, abilities, disabilities. The justification by faith intends to tear all that down and replace it with a bridge. And this isn't easy always. And it can be hard. Uh, my wife and I visited, we, we, we were in, gra- when we were in graduate school, our, our first uh, holiday, in, major holiday in grad school was, was Thanksgiving. We're, we're in Cincinnati, all our family's out this direction. We, you know, we'd only been there for a couple months. We didn't have a whole lot of close friends. We didn't want to be miserable and lonely on Thanksgiving, so we decided, let's just take a little trip on Thanksgiving break. So we got in the car, we went to uh, Richmond, Virginia, we went to Colonial Williamsburg, we went to Petersburg National Battlefield where the last major battle of the Civil War was fought. We had a great time um, on this little trip. And we were going to drive back home on Sunday because I had class on Monday. And so we, again, pre-internet, so we open up what's called a phone book. Okay? Some of you may not know what this is, but it's it's an actual book that has phone numbers in it. Uh, Amazing. Shocking. (laughs) I know. What's amazing even more is they still put them on your doorstep because no one uses them. So we got out a phone book. We looked up churches in the area. We found a church, and the address was fairly close to where we were at in Richmond. And so we thought, we'll visit this church. So we get up on Sunday morning. We get ready. We pack our car because we're going to leave from here and drive nine hours back to Cincinnati. And we, we walk into the church. And we're a butterscotch chip in a sea of chocolate. <laughs> and we stand out like a sore thumb. Um, and here's what happened. People came from all around the auditorium to shake our hands and to say hi and ask us our names and who we were. Because it was obvious we were visitors. <laughs> Just saying, right? But we got a warm, hearty welcome. There was actually one woman who was clear up front and lit, is out, room about this size, and we had just walked in. She was clear up front. She literally, she was probably 50 years old. She hopped over a pew and hopped over another one to get to the aisle and ran down the aisle to welcome us because she wanted us to know, though you are white, you are welcome here. And that's good news, isn't it? But here's the thing. When you're just visiting a church, it's easy to get a warm welcome. But if we're going to live together fellowship together over the long haul, it gets hard, doesn't it? It gets difficult. Why? Because our differences run deep. Our prejudices and our assumptions run deep. It gets all twisted up in our heart and soul, and we've got to figure it out. And sometimes we make mistake, mistakes like Peter do, right? Like we've got to figure this out. How are we going to do this? So a handful, about two months ago, I preached uh, at a church in Boise, large church, guest preacher, right? People don't necessarily know me. Preach at this church. Begin my sermon by telling a story about Haiti um, and doing a pastor's conference in Haiti and just showed some pictures of Haiti itself, the area we were in and all of that. Well, preach the sermon, get done, 
about a week later, I get a, an email from one of the pastors at the church saying, hey, there was a gal in our congregation who was really offended by your Haiti illustration. Would you mind talking to her? I said, sure, I'll talk to her. So he coordinated. We met in the lobby after service one Sunday. Um, gave me a little context beforehand so I knew what I was stepping into. Um, and I'll tell you what. I felt like she completely misunderstood my illustration. I felt like she so misunderstood my, my illustration that she misunderstood the whole point of the sermon because she wanted to walk out because of the way I gave that illustration. And I wanted to defend myself. Right? It would have been easy to defend myself, I felt like. Like, you, you misunderstood what I was getting at. I was pointing out cultural differences between Haitian culture and American culture so that I can make the point about we're supposed to be different because we live Jesus' culture. So that was the only point. But this gal, she wasn't the color of my skin. And her husband was from the, the DR, from the Dominican Republic. And they heard my illustration very differently than all the white people in the room heard the illustration. And she was offended. And it would have been easy for me to get upset, right? To go on the defensive. I listened. I took to heart what she had to say. Um, I still think she misunderstood some of the things I was trying to say. I tried to clarify some of those things gently so that she would hopefully hear what I was trying to say. Um, if I were to preach in that church again, would she come and sit through the sermon? I don't know. But I hope because of the gospel of justification by faith, she'd give me another shot. She would do it. And not only that, I preached that same sermon about three weeks ago, and I changed how I told that illustration because she had some really good feedback that I needed to hear that I couldn't hear because I don't have her experiences and her perspective, and I don't have her husband's experiences and her husband's perspective. So I made sure I threw in plenty of positive things about Haitians and Haitian culture. So everyone would know, I'm not running down Haitians. I'm pointing out differences. And there's some really good differences. Things I like about Haitian culture that I don't like about American culture. Because she had some really good feedback. And you see, when we let the gospel begin to tear down the differences between us and build those bridges between us, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. It's going to get messy. We're going to misunderstand each other. We're going to assume things about each other that we shouldn't assume. We're going to hear things we shouldn't hear. But for the love of God, literally, let's stay together and figure it out. Let's sit at the table. Let's listen. Let's give grace. And let's realize that justification by faith doesn't only fix this. It fixes this. And let's work hard at it. Let's work hard at it. Let's put in the time. And let's not get so offended that we just walk away and give up. Let's listen. Let's ask questions. And when, when we're hurt by somebody of a, different, of a different culture or a different background, somebody who's different, when we're hurt by them, let's not just write them off and say, well, let's say God. God is trying to form a humanity where people of, of different backgrounds come together and love each other so they can show the watching world there's a different way of being human. There's a different way of doing life. And it looks a whole lot like self-sacrificial love. Like the very love of Jesus who laid down his life for you because he loved you and he wants you to do the same for all people, especially those who are nearest you and who aren't like you.